Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Chris Zaug about transforming the workplace and helping leaders find the time to develop their people. Chris Zaug, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Great to be here, John. Looking forward to it. Great to be with you. You're joining us from the Minneapolis area. I'm south of Salt Lake City (laughs) in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about transforming the workplace and helping leaders to find the time to develop their people. Now, I come from the perspective that the number one goal of leadership is to develop people. And so I, I don't quite even, I can't wrap my head around this idea that leaders aren't developing their people because that's what leaders do. But the reality is in a lot of organizations, a lot of leaders aren't doing much of or any development of their people. That's really not the focus. And they're, they're spending most of their time running around like a chicken with their head cut off, trying to put out fires and just operationally managing uh, things and doing the administrative tasks. And of course that stuff needs to happen, but uh, but you know, really developing your people in my mind is what it's all about. So we're going to talk about how we can maybe help our people transform the culture, transform their mindset, transform their approach so that they do find that they have the time to, to work on the development of their people. Uh, and in my mind that then creates a reinforcing reciprocal upward spiral process of just like making everything better. So that's what we're going to be exploring together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Chris's bio with everybody. Uptick co-founder and president Chris Zaug has over three decades worth of experience building and managing teams, both in the nonprofit world and the marketplace. He's passionate about establishing and maintaining trusting relationships with his team members and helping others to do the same. Over the years, Chris has had some great mentors and coaches and has been privileged to coach dozens of folks himself. As a trained musician, he traveled for years in rock bands, complete with 80s hair, and he loves sports of any kind, watching or playing. Chris and his wife, Susan, have been married for 30 years and have four wonderful children. That is fantastic. (laughs) I really want to see a picture of you from the 80s and uh, some of that awesome hair. Uh, But I can kind of envision that you have a nice head of hair right now. (laughs) Well, back in the day, people, when they see the picture of me in the band, they say you had the hair of Daryl Hall and the mustache of John Oates. So I was trying to, I was trying to, I'm trying to get both the hollow notes vibe going on. So, yeah. Very nice. And rocking the stash. Excellent. Yeah, for sure. For Very sure. good. And you have a little bit of time on me. Uh, I've been married for about 20 years, um, but uh, family life is, is wonderful. And mm. I commend you, commend you for that. That's becoming more and more rare, it seems, um, in this day for and age. Sure. So, so congratulations on, on a long, successful marriage and a wonderful family. Well, thanks so much. It's such a priority for us. You know, we, uh, we, when my wife and I first got married, it was kind of like, you know, everything is in, everything is in the, the game, except for not being together. <laughs> so when you, when you start there and you go, okay, well, then we're going to work it out. And uh, the four kids have been just phenomenal. We, they're adults now. So, and I was kind of an old husband. I, we got married. I was in my thirties when we got married. So um, we've, we've taken a little bit of the slow boat, but I still have an 18 year old senior in high school at home and I'm over 60. So we're kind of, we're kind of living in a different spot. And you have the magic serum. I'm going to say, I would not have in a million years guessed you were over 60. 
Um, well, thanks. So... Don't get too close, man. <laughs> don't, do, don't get too close. You'll see the cracks later. Yeah, yeah. But it's been a great journey for us, John. And, that, and actually, it informs me in a lot of ways, even in the stuff we're going to talk about in terms of uh, relationships, because those are the key things. And as you know, as a dad and as a husband, um, that is really the bedrock of of having a great family. It's not, you know, running people through this the system of things that makes them more efficient because relationships are inefficient by nature. And actually relationships in the workplace are no different. When you're really going to dive into them, they're just not an efficient place, but you have to live with that inefficiency in order to get the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, loyalty and trust that you want to build with your team. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, let's start there. And you, you do a lot of work in this transforming the workplace kind mm-hmm. of space um, there's a lot of different ways we can think about transformation in the workplace. So maybe start with what you envision as as some of those those key transformational areas that need to occur in in many, if not most, workplaces, so that we have more dynamic teams, so that we have you know really sustainable strategic organizations that will be able to continue to add value to the market for years to come, and not just be a flash in the pan. Totally. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in my career is that uh, I, t- people typically want to start with some sort of numerical gauge of how people are doing on their team. And they're, they're thinking about metrics, which is totally appropriate, uh, but they're not thinking about what are the things that drive the metric. And in, in my, <laughs> my first leadership job ever, I was an 11-year-old in, at Elliott School when my principal, Mrs. Towie, said, Chris, I'd like you to be the, the captain of all the patrols in school all the patrols, the bus patrols, the school patrols, the street guards, and all that stuff. So naturally, as an 11-year-old, I did what any good 11-year-old boomer would do. And I set up a, a system of merits and demerits. And I was like, you know, like, I'm going to you know, put the hammer down on these people. And I didn't get to know anybody. I just was like this, this little tyrant, you know. <laughs> and as I, as I grew in leadership to when I was a manager, manager of McDonald's in the 70s when I was in high school, and I, I learned that, that people were the key. But I still kept messing up. I still kept thinking, okay, what, what, what's the key to this? Because I, I would either go to the, this very strict side of let's take a productivity, make sure we're doing that well, or I would go completely relational, have a lot of grace with people. It's okay. It's wonderful. But the key for me that I was missing was striving for clarity. And it kind of came down, John, to a situation I had with one of my teammates uh, in, in our company here. He came to me and he said, Chris, um, man, I really appreciate the way you cheerlead for me, the way you look out for me. Um, You're really enthusiastic, but sometimes I feel like I'm not accomplishing the things that you would like me to accomplish, or at least I'm not, I was spending too much time on the, on the thing, on certain things. And I'd like to meet with you and talk about my priorities. Can we do that? I said, sure. Yeah. Let's meet on Monday morning and um, right. Once you write out a list of all the things that are your priorities and we'll talk through them. And so he shows up on Monday morning with a list of 35 things. Okay. He's got 35 priorities that are his priorities. Now, if you're familiar with the strengths finder, he's got responsibility as his number one. So like anything he hears is his responsibility. Right. So I said, well, and and let's just put a a really fine point on it. If you have 35 priorities, you don't have any priority. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And that's literally what I said to him. I said, okay. So I got out the pen broke out the pen. And I I said, okay, we're just going to start scratching stuff off. And he's looking at me in horror, like, uh, uh, who's going to do these things? And I said, not you. (laughs) And we just moved on, you know? And I said, look, I'll I'll take responsibility if these balls get dropped. But as, as you know, a lot of times people take things on, that they think are priorities that aren't really necessary to anyone. They're just, they, they want to be responsible. So we did that. We kind of got it down to four or five priorities. And I said, let's meet again next Monday and let's see how you did. John, I mean, he was a completely different guy the next week because he was like, oh, wait, I'm winning. I'm actually winning. And that was kind of the first clue to me. I mean, I've had good working relationships with my teams forever. I've had one-on-ones. I'm generally a relational guy and I love people. So I think people liked working with me. But over my career, as I look back, I see lots of times where there were gaps, where people were feeling good about our relationship, but they weren't feeling good about their own productivity or their own job or their own progression in their professional development. And I thought, okay, well, I'm responsible for part of that because I wasn't clarifying those things with them. And so it really kind of shocked me. Then later on in the same year, I had a team that was transferred over to me. And for a number of reasons, this team was pretty beat up. Uh, They'd had had some issues with their leadership where their unmet expectations every meeting. So they're working hard. They're trying to do the right thing. They show up in the meeting to present their stuff and they get crushed. 
by the leadership. So they they didn't trust any of us. And when I got when they got assigned to me, and I was going to be their their manager, um, they didn't trust me either. Even though I didn't have anything to do with that stuff, they're like, "Well, he's one of them." And so uh, I thought right away, I've got to come up with a strategy to help clarify what their role is, because that's the key to them. Every person's different. The key to these guys were, hey, look, will you clarify my work so that I know that I'm, again, doing these expectations, that I have the right priorities, I'm doing them in the right order. Can we clarify that? And John, literally within eight weeks, those dudes were completely transformed. And then we could talk about the other things like professional development or what are the obstacles? How can I give you better resources to do your role? Um, how's the team doing? What are you noticing of other teammates that you can help me so I can help them? I mean, that kind of stuff. But it started with clarity and making sure the expectations were right size for people. Yeah. I mean, so often that's the case, isn't it? Yeah. Because the world is a big, messy, complex place and we're all juggling all these different things and being able to keep all the balls in the air uh, is challenging for the, the most agile among us, right? right. And, and so learning how to prioritize and having clarity over expectations, all of that is just super, super important. Uh, mm -hmm. So when we, when we can establish some of those foundational principles, it really can be a game changer. And nothing you just shared is rocket science. No, you know? no. <laughs> all, all the things that we talk about day after day on this podcast, they're not rocket science, yet they're not being done consistently in organizations. Uh, it's why there's a whole big business for consulting work and my people listen mm -hmm. to these podcasts, it's because even the best intentioned individuals and organizations still fail to do these things consistently. Um, and so it's, you know, don't feel like you have to reinvent the wheel. Don't feel like you have to like create some new process or some new uh, magical formula to try to fix everything. Mm -hmm. Focus in on the tried and true principles and do them consistently. And if you do that, I mean, that's probably going to make up at least 80, 90% of the difference in, in making things better. Absolutely. Uh, it was interesting. I was talking with a guy this week who is the CEO of a really large nonprofit and they're having issues with their teams and, 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 and their HR people are literally walking around with fire hoses every day. And all they're doing is like putting out fires, putting out fires. And I said to my, my friend, I said, yeah, you got to put the fires out, but if you don't clear the brush, you're just going to start again. So it's, it's, it's clearing the brush out of your organization. And, and, and as you said, it's not rock and science. It's just, it's relational. It's, 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 you know, creating clarity, developing relationships, having trust. And all of a sudden, a lot, I mean, trust covers a multitude of sins, right? I, I'm, not, I'm not the greatest leader in the world. I screw up all the time. But if my team trusts me and they know that I trust them, I'll get a lot more grace than if I'm just kind of trying to drive, drive, drive. And I, I've listened to, listened to your podcast and I'm telling you, you're right. 80 to 90% of the stuff you need to lead your team is there. It's right there in front of you. Trust and relationships is what it's all about. And uh, one thing, you know, as we were preparing for this episode, you shared, you know, one study that shows that 57% of employees left a job due to their managers. And, and frankly, there's lots of studies that have demonstrated that is one of the number one reason. It's often the number one reason, if not one of the top reasons why people will leave a job that otherwise, you know, it's a good job to career, good career opportunity. They're getting paid well, whatever, but they choose to leave. Why? Mm -hmm. Because of bad relationships. I've done a lot of research in this space as well. Uh, and, and relationships with manager, that's a huge piece relationships with coworkers that's also a huge piece the reality is you can have a pretty sick organizational culture like a mm -hmm. really toxic environment but if you have mm -hmm. an awesome team and you're kind of like in a little awesome bubble with a great manager yeah. and great people you're kind of insulated and you don't even know how toxic the organization is you're probably going to be fine on the right. flip side if you have an organization that's amazing the culture is amazing everything everyone's wonderful but your little team is you have toxic people, you have a toxic manager, guess what? You're not going to be engaged. You're not going to be happy. You're going to be looking at the exit and looking for your next opportunity. So relationships are where it's at. And if we can't do that, it's going to be really hard, if not impossible, to develop the trust that's needed to sustain a, a healthy organization, to drive successful change, to promote innovation, all of those things. Check out my new book, The Future Leader, Creating and Transforming Next-Gen Organizations. 
stemming from two decades of professional experience and over 600 in-depth interviews with executives, thought leaders, and scholars from across the globe. The Future Leader will help you explore the ordinary, everyday actions that will help you to prepare to lead in the future of work, to respond to an uncertain future, and to produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Academy. Courses, micro credentials, and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. All HCI Academy courses, micro credentials, and certificates are designed, developed, and delivered by award winning and internationally renowned scholars, educators, thought leaders, executives, and practitioners. Our courses, micro credentials, and certificates will help you make your mark on the future of work and make an immediate impact in your organizations. Check out the HCI Academy and our many course offerings and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. That has been demonstrated time and again, and you know, because you've researched it. I just know by observation. I talk with hundreds of managers as we're working through our product, and so many start with, I don't even know where, where to start. I, I really don't. Like, like I'm getting these edicts from my upper management. These are the goals that we need to, to create. And then I'm trying to hand out goals to my team, like you hand out, you know, uh, goldfish to three-year-olds, you know, just like, here, just go, just go for it. But if people don't know what they're supposed to do in the context of relationship, you can't, you can't, it's not either or I'll give you an illustration. So several years ago, I came back, the organization that I was leading in this nonprofit had about a hundred people and some major things in our market changed major things. And so I had this epiphany, I'm sitting on the deck and a fishing trip in Alaska. And I'm like, okay, I got to make some serious changes. I come back and I, going to sit down with my team, you know, and I'm not the kind of guy that has a lot of these come to Jesus meetings, but I had three of them in six weeks. And in these, these six weeks, I'm like, okay, these are the things we need to do. This is where we're going for. This is the vision. Here's the mission. And, you know, people are nodding their heads, John, and their little tear comes from their eye. And yeah, Chris, we're hundred percent with you. Fast forward like two years and uh, things just aren't happening as fast as they should be happening. I, I'm frustrated. And I'm sitting with my leadership team and I'm like, I, I'm really frustrated that people aren't getting it. We're not f- moving forward more quickly. Finally, my HR director looks at me and says, can I ask you a question, Chris? I said, yeah, sure. I said, okay. Um, do you know what you're supposed to do every day? I said, well, yeah, generally. And you have priorities. You're right. You, you set these in priorities. I said, yeah, I generally do. He said, do you get them done? I said, well, yeah. I mean, most of the time I do. He said, we don't have any of that. Essentially saying, Chris, your inspirational speeches are really nice, but it's like feeding a person chocolate every day. You know, they still need their veggies. They still need their steak. And you're not giving us any of that. There was no clarity. So immediately I was like, oh, my goodness. And at that point, I just grabbed the the closest book to me, which was the four disciplines of execution and thought, okay, I we're going to do this. And it was so helpful because people had clarity. And, and all of a sudden, the, there was a collective sigh of relief from the team because we had enough relationship. They trusted me personally, but they weren't getting the kind of clarity that was going to make that beautiful mix of clarity and relationship that would become this, you know, this bonfire. We were just like this flickering thing that I kept spritzing on every time I would give one of these, these uh, you know, inspirational quote unquote talks that didn't inspire anyone to action just to feel good about Chris, which was not great. Yeah. And the, the, uh, those, those types of opportunities, you, you mentioned the come to Jesus meetings, the inspirational speeches and those, I mean, those have a place and, and sometimes those can really be a game changer, but they have to always be followed up with action and implementation. Mm-hmm. Right. And right. I remember, man, I was, this was a long, long time ago. I was probably early twenties. Um, maybe 2021. And I, I remember coming to this realization that I, I would go to like this big 
combined meeting. And, the, and the, the point of the whole meeting for the day was to get everyone just motivated and rah-rah and everyone's excited and then go off and go do your stuff and, and do it well, right? Mm -hmm. And I would leave those meetings, I would go off and then within like a day or two, all of that energy would dissipate. <laughs> and I'm a, okay. I'm a very disciplined person. I always have been a disciplined person. I'm all, I've always been a consistent, hardworking person. So it wasn't a matter of lacking motivation or lacking discipline, but it, it, it just, it taught me in that moment that all of that emotion that can really be the, the can help create the momentum to drive change. Mm -hmm. It will dissipate quickly if mm -hmm. it's not followed up on. Uh, and so it's necessary, it's important, but then you have to have those opportunities where you communicate expectations, you have clarity over roles, you have people understand what marching orders are and what they need to go do. And then you, and then you follow up and you have opportunities to, to have people reconnect and share what they've accomplished and what they're doing. And it, it, it becomes this ongoing thing, right? And that's, mm -hmm. that's how it needs to happen. And in a lot of organizations, they never have the rah, rah, come to Jesus moments in the first place. And if they do, right. they don't follow it up in a way that's right. going to help move things forward. So your experience is not unique. I mean, that happens in a lot of organizations. Right. Uh, and you came to that realization. And obviously, we're able to, to make changes. And that it's a good lesson. Like, we all need to, to realize that we need to be reminded of that repeatedly. Um, you know, that that we consistently just have to be making uh not just emotional buy-in as a priority, but we have to have like tactical buy-in. We have to have implementation over time. Exactly. And I think a lot of managers think they have to do all of that themselves, right? So I've got to, I've got to be the inspirational guy. I've got to be the operational guy. I've got to be, I've got, I have to do all these things. And that's a great way to end up in a rubber room, right? And so one of the things that managers need to do is identify the strengths and weaknesses they have on their team and release people to do those things. So for instance, when I was on a leadership team, um, I'm not the greatest guy to, to lead a meeting at times because I can go off on a tangents and I get into the vision space and I'm certain, you know, I sort of, we need to be hovering at about 5,000 feet and I'm up at 80,000 feet and they're like, Hey, back, come back. So I actually had a guy on my team that I said, you're going to be the facilitator of the meeting. And what that means is you get to tell me to shut up. <laughs> like, like we're going to, in a nice way, but, you know, just say, hey, we're going to move on to something that we decided we're going to do. And I think sometimes as managers, we're afraid to give away the keys to other people. But as, as we, and, and of course, you need to do that appropriately. If you don't have people on your team that can do it, initially, you may have to do most of those things. But you should be looking for people on your team that can help you. As an example, uh, Myers-Briggs tests get kind of a bad rap from some people. But if you're, if you're into it at all, you know that there's P's and there's J's. And the P's are kind of open-ended people, they're dreamers, they're going to be really out there. And the J's have a list, and they're taking care of checking off the list. They really want to dive into it. I'm a hyper P, and so I made it my job to make sure that I surrounded myself with J's, with people who weren't like me. Now, there's a dirty little secret out there that all J's think that P's are idiots, and there's, there's, there's part of that that's true, you know, but, but, uh, but I still needed them and loved them because they helped me accomplish and execute in ways that were unnatural for me as a guy who tends to fly higher in vision. So I think one of the things I'd say to managers to make your job easier is to identify people on your team that can help you lead in these areas. Because what you said, John, is the key. You've got you to have the inspiration. You've got to have the execution in order to have kind of a clear place that this is where we're going. And so people feel like at the end of the day, they're winning. And that's what we want right? As managers, you want your people at the end of the day, you want to high five them on the way out the door. Hey, great job today. You won today, as opposed to, I have no idea what winning even looks like here, which is where a lot of teams live. Yeah, it, it really, really is. And that's not to say there aren't good intentions, um, right. but the, it's just the reality. And, and it kind of gets to maybe the next point, the last point for our conversation today. And that is, and you referred to this earlier, when a lot of leaders are running around like chickens with their head cut off, putting out fires all day. The reality in that environment, when, when that's what's modeled for your team, then what end, ends up inevitably happening is many members of your team, if not all of your team, they end up doing the same thing. So they end up just kind of running around, putting out fires and being reactionary rather than proactive and strategic. And, and so, and then there's just no time for anything else. Like you're just trying to like survive the day. And 
I get it. Like there's, there's a time, there are times where there are catastrophes, emergencies, things that just have to be addressed and other priorities get set aside. But if that's your day to day, if that's how it is every day, then there's something seriously wrong <laughs> with right. the culture, the, the style and the systems within your team and within your organization. Um, and, and so we need to be helping to build our people. We can only do that if we can take a good hard look at how the, what the experience in the workplace is like, and if we have space to do it, because mm-hmm. we can have the best intentions in the world, but if we're, if we're just overwhelmed constantly and our people are overwhelmed constantly, guess what? We're not going to have the time to help them develop. They're not going to have the time to develop and they may right. not even have the desire to develop because they're just so busy trying to do everything they need to do. So uh, may, do you have any thoughts and ideas on how we can go about breaking up that hyper, you know, just like constant go, 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 putting out fires kind of mentality that many people have so we can refocus on development. Yeah. Yeah, I do actually. (laughs) And I thought about this with, you know, you're a dad and I'm a dad and what we model to our kids, they were likely to repeat. So if, if I'm treating my wife with respect and love, it's, it's likely that they will as well. But if I'm disrespecting her, then they feel the same kind of freedom. Same thing is true at work, right? What they see, what they see modeled is what they think is the standard. That's what we're going to do. Okay, so um, if I'm Mach 2 with my hair on fire all the time, they're going to think, well, that's what it means to, to, to be a good worker here. And John, the words of death to me are when someone comes to me and said, says, I would have come to you earlier but I know you're busy. I'm like, my job as your leader is to make your job great. That is my job. So first and foremost, I'm here for you. I'm not an overlord. I'm an under shepherd. Okay. I'm, I'm coming, I'm giving you, giving you strength. And so for us, for me personally, where I really found that was in diving into one-on-ones, regularly scheduled, non-cancelable one-on-ones that I did with my team. Now, the first thing that people say when I say that is like, oh, I don't have time for that. I got too much. Okay, really? Like if you're driving to the store and you have a busy day and all the the, the, uh, hazard lights or or, or all the engine lights come on in your car and you see blue smoke coming from your engine, you're not going to stop. You're going to stop because, you know, it's it's, because your car is a big investment and you don't want to end up junking it, right? The same thing is true of the, 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 your team. You've got to take the time to do the maintenance things that will keep the team flowing. So for me, regular one-on-ones with my team, they don't have to be long. They can be, because we're doing them weekly, sometimes they're 15 minutes. They're just little touch bases. We, we t- touch on goals and priorities. And then we have, uh, in, our, in our product, we have these questions that rotate. So we call them decks and you pick a category and you get a different question every week. So it kind of keeps it lively. They're provocative. So you get a chance to build the relationship, but also clarify the work. And that has proven to be amazing. And I, the proof was with my team. I finally asked them, I said, okay, is this, is this better like than it used to be? And they're like, oh my gosh, don't ever stop doing these. Because we feel like we're tied into the vision but we're also being resourced with the things that we need. And we can talk about the problems. And John, we have really raw conversations between, and, and some of it is, is the managers also have to find a way to be transparent. So if you're the know-it-all manager, you have the answer to every question, you're not going to engender any kind of trust with your team because they're not going to feel there's any reciprocal thing. But if you, you're saying to them, you know, John, I, I really struggle with that too. And here's how I struggle with it. And you kind of get in there with them, that that will go a million miles toward helping them feel a higher level of engagement, which all the stats show that shows a lot more productivity, a lot more identification with the brand. You're 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 getting rid of some of the fear of the great resignation. All of these things that managers are feeling all the time tend to go away when you're having that regular contact with your team. So yeah, there's my answer. Have one-on-ones with your team, have them regularly. Don't cancel them. Don't do the, you okay? I'm okay. Yep. Okay. We won't have a meeting today, which is what we do. We do it, right? Yeah. I'm guilty. I've done that. (laughs) Oh, for sure. Me too. Me too. But now I'm just trying to get religious about it. Like we're not going to do it. We're going to meet. Because I've seen yeah. the difference that's made in my team. Yeah, wonderful. Well, Chris, it has just been a pleasure. We've just scratched the surface. I think we could go on and on and on. But for today, we're going to have to leave it there. I need to let you go and get on with yeah. your busy day. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, uh, any resources you want to share, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. 
Yeah, for sure. Well, if you want to check out what we're about, we're at upticapp.com. We're an application that kind of deals with those one-on-ones and making meaningful relationships between managers and team members. So check that out. We also have a blog there under the education piece, so you can check that out. I'm also going to um, give John a link to a, a resource that we have called How to Give Great One-on-Ones. And feel free to download that. I think it's been really helpful for a lot of people. And contact us with any other thing you'd like to, to chat about. We've got our... our, our uh, contact information on the site. So we'd absolutely love to hear from you all. And we'd love to hear your experiences as well, because that helps inform not just what we're building, but our philosophy. And as a as a leader, I mean, John, you referenced it before, we're, we're lifelong learners, right? We're always learning more about leadership. We're trying to add that 1% to our, to our portfolio that we can help build to, to invest more into the people that we lead. The last thing I would say is this, in, in my eyes, there's no more worthy investment than investing in your team. We believe that people are, are created for something bigger than themselves. Being a part of work that is meaningful, where they're, where they're valued, where they're in their best state, doing their best work is so, so important. And so don't bypass the investment into your people. It's, it makes all the difference. It does. Amen. Well said, Chris. It has just been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Chris and his team can do for you. Check out the resources that Chris just shared. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Bluer than Indigo Leadership the journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon even at the producer and sponsorship levels. 
Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.